So um, I, I kind of missed this morning uh, roundtable introduction. So introducing myself, some of you know me. Uh, I've seen a lot of you here. It's, by the way, it's great to be back in person with a lot of people we've been on the phone with. I'm Gary O'Neill. I've been involved with SPDX uh, since the beginning with Kate. Uh, I'm usually known as the tool guy. I wrote some of the initial tools. It was supposed to just be a pretty printer, but now it's like thousands of lines of code and does all kinds of stuff. But uh, I've been involved from the very beginning. Um, one role that I play in SPDX 3.0 is, um, is to kind of represent you know, the, 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 the community that is using SPDX 2.3 and think about compatibility. So if there's something that just absolutely won't work in 3.0, I'll raise a huge red flag. If there's something that makes it hard, I'll kind of raise a yellow flag. So, um, so with that as kind of the perspective, I'm going to go through a comparison of 2.3 to 3.0 from a migration perspective. So those of you that are new to SPDX, I'll apologize in advance. This is probably going to sound a bit tedious to you. From those of you that are using SPDX 2.3 today, I think you'll find it a bit more interesting. But I'll also try to point out some of the uh, more fundamental changes um, in the model that are more conceptual, uh, especially at the beginning, so mm -hmm. that it'll give you a little bit more of a context for you know, what's being changed. So to start out, um, a lot of this was covered already, but um, why are the changes? Uh, you've seen some of the additional use cases already presented. Um, clearly, they need additional fields. It also impacts some of the structural changes. One of the, the, the next major reason for changes is to simplify. The number one feedback we've gotten from the very beginning, from the very first survey we've ever sent out on SPDX, people, we asked people, you know, what's your biggest concern about SPDX? It's just too complicated. And I think, I think a lot of that relates to the large number of use cases we support. And so if you want to do, you know, licensing, you know, you got these fields. If you want to do security, you got these fields. If you want to have detailed source information, you got these fields. So you look at it in aggregate, it looks really, really complicated. So we made some changes, some structural <laughs> changes that we believe will simplify the spec. So that was definitely one of our objective. Now, I will admit, at the same time that we've been simplifying, we've been making it more complicated because we've been adding more use cases as well. So I'm hoping the net effect by all this is it is simpler and it covers more use cases. Uh, and the last one is uh, flexibility. And this, this one actually has a fairly substantial impact on the structure of SPDX. Now, let me, let me give you an example about flexibility. Um, Today, in SPDX 2.3, if I want to send SPDX information to you, I have to include it in an entire document. So I got to wrap everything up in one document and send it to you. Um, we had one person in, uh, in the SPDX community saying, hey, I'm going to produce an SBOM on every GitHub commit or every git commit, I should say. Every git commit, they're going to produce one. And it's only going to be these little teeny changes. So how in the world can I do that if I have to reproduce every single element, every single file, you know, reproduce everything? And then how are these amend relationships to tie it all up? That's just crazy. So we've made some structural changes to make it a lot more flexible, and I think in the end made it a lot more scalable too. So one thing you're going to see in SPDX 3.0 is much larger implementations of SPDX with much larger numbers of elements um, that I, I think is, is pretty exciting. So that's another one of the things. So let me, let me go over some of the structural changes. Um, the first one is profiles, which you know there was a, a good question raised earlier on the profiles. Profiles is introduced really for simplicity. Now, profiles can be a little confusing because we're really kind of talking about three different things when we talk about the profiles. Um, the first thing is conformance requirements. So if I'm giving you an SBOM and I'm telling you this SBOM can be used for security, it, it supports a security profile, it better have some of the minimum requirements for security. I better be able to correlate it back to a database of uh, vulnerabilities. I better be able to have the version information for the packages. And these things may or may not be interesting to people who want to use the licensing profile. But if I'm using the licensing profile, I better have a concluded license. I better have a declared license. So when we, uh, we, we you can think of these as like conformance points. Uh, one of our contributors from MITRE introduced that uh, term to us. Um, so these conformance points are part of a profile. They're also a namespace. Now, what I mean by a namespace is if you look in our Git repository, each directory 
has, is for the profile, and that's going to be a different namespace. And it just helps us organize it, you know, be, organize the information so that if you're interested in this, you can search on that namespace and ignore the stuff you don't want to see. And the last thing is actually how we organize. You'll see different teams uh, that actually are producing these uh, different work groups around the different profiles. So that's the, that's the way profiles work. We are introducing a mandatory uh, new field which tells which profiles you're supporting. And at a minimum, you would be supporting the core profile. Uh, and most likely, you'll be supporting the software profile. But beyond that, all the other profiles are really the choice of you as the producer or you as the consumer, which you're requiring of your producers. Another structural change is the uh, external document references. So in um, uh, when today in SPDX 2.3, this, this I know is going to be the most tedious slide. I, I apologize for, especially those of you who are not in 2.3. Um, in 2.3, if you want to reference an element that's not in the SPDX document, we've, you basically have an external document ref that points outside of that. In SPDX 3.0, we move this down into each individual element, so it can actually support uh, the, uh, the references externally, and we split it into two different classes. There's not one class anymore, but two. One that describes the imports, so basically the imports will say, this is where I got it from, this is the package, this is a checksum of the SPDX document, this is you know, enough information to know where it came from, and the namespace map gives you the information about the shorthand references within the document itself. So we separate it out into two different classes, the functionality that makes it more readable and the functionality that makes it verifiable. And, uh, but all that functionality is there, but it is a structural change and it will impact. If you have tooling, you'll have to adjust the tooling to the, uh, to the new format. Relationships, I, I think this is one of the most impactful, and I guess there was a question on relationships as well. Relationships are important to us in the SPDX community. Um, for in SPDX 2.3, a relationship was a property of the element. So when I produce an element and I deliver that to you, I tell you what all the related items are. The problem with that is that if I want to change that relationship, I have to create a new element, because once you create an element, okay, let me go off on a little tangent. This is a very important point for SPDX. Once you create an element, it's done. Once you deliver that element, once you ship that element, it's, we call it minted. It's like you've minted it and you cannot change it again because people are relying on that data. So that element is minted. Now I want to add a new relationship. Oh, I got to go you know, create a whole new element with all the same information. So let me pause there. I see a couple looks. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. That's a very important concept. Okay. So in SPDX 3.0, we moved the relationship out to be its own element. So instead of it being a property of an element itself, it's its own thing. So you can now create a new SPDX document using the external refs that I was talking about a slide ago, and I can point from one element to another. So if I want to introduce a new build relationship or if I want to introduce a new security you know, information relationship, like a, a VEX information, I can just drop in an element and I don't have to change a thing on the from and the to. Everything's updated. It's very important for the scalability. Make sense? All right. Um, there's a few other miscellaneous. Those are the big ones, by the way. Um, entities, uh, which I think we're going to rename to agents, I don't know. <laughs> this may get renamed, but uh, uh, there is a, uh, we've restructured, right now in SPDX 2.3, we have a string field for person, tool, or whatever, it's just a string, right? And you can parse it or, you know, uh, you know deal with it as you wish. We're making it much more structured in 3.0, where we've separated out, you know, um, uh, you know identities that are uh, entities, that have some kind of a, uh, what's it called, the, uh, the, the naming authority, you know, so, so you can go to an authority and know that's who the person is, or maybe it's just a, uh, uh, you know, just, you know, so, uh, just a name of something or an email that you have, but it's much more structured there. Um, file type enumerations has been replaced by two fields, so it's a little bit structural. Uh, we have a media type, which is uh, basically we're using the 
the standard uh, media type strings that are uh, standardized. So we've moved completely to that. And then the content to the file and enumeration, we've moved to uh, software purpose for the purpose of the, of the file as well. So we've separated the purpose from the, uh, the media type. And we've moved again to a complete standardization. So we're not inventing our own uh, media types anymore, which is kind of nice. Uh, package file name and package checksum have been replaced by a relationship from a package to a file. Again, this improves the flexibility. External identifiers, um, we split that into two different things. So we actually now have an external identifier which has this kind of naming authority associated with it and an external reference which doesn't. So, um, so some fields require an identifier you know, for, for uh, provenance or security reasons. And some fields are okay just having a reference. Um, so we, we and s some of the use cases require that distinction. Package URLs, any, any fans of package URLs here? Okay, one, two, okay, good, good. It's now a top level property. So we've elevated it up from being just one of many external identifiers, identifiers or references, to being a property of every element. So it's easy to find and something that uh, you can almost, if you want to have like a primary identifier, you can use it for that in uh, SPDX uh, 3. Uh, annotations and relationships are independent uh, elements. So I already talked about relationship annotations are the same way. So you can add annotations after the fact. And snippets have been simplified. So I won't go into the details on snippets because quite honestly not that many people use them. Maybe after Jeff's talk, well, more people will, I hope so, but uh, <laughs> we've simplified them. Um, and I'm gonna go through some, some really uh, more details of the migration. Uh, here's some classes and properties that are removed. Uh, files analyzed, those of you familiar with uh, 2.3, um, this is the most hated property in SPDX, and everybody is happy to get rid of it. So that's gone. Um, it's actually, the functionality is replaced by profiles. So you, it's still, the, the functionality is still there, it's just covered by profiles rather than uh, through this property. Um, the license info in files, uh, right now it's removed, but there is an issue to bring that back in again. But uh, there is a um, proposal that this is redundant with declared files and uh, is no longer needed. And I think there's one that I miss on the properties removed. Yeah, I think those are the, those are the main ones. Um, a number of properties got renamed. Uh, some of these, I, I'll be honest with you, I pushed back on and wasn't successful. So if there's anything up here that gives you a heartburn, you know, feel free to, uh, to raise issues. The first one I definitely agree with, which is external document ref. That was really confusing because we have external reference and external document ref. They mean two totally different things. And uh, that's, that's caused a lot of confusion. We've gotten feedback on that in the SPDX2. So that's fixed. Uh, we've changed package file name and file name just to name. Uh, as part of the model, uh, we changed version to package version. Um, and then uh, the with, there's a few licensing cha name changes that go with the with addition operator that uh, was presented earlier, um, extracted license info, custom license, and uh, actually I think we changed package purpose back to primary package purpose. At least I put in a request for that. <laughs> yeah, so which may be a, may be a structural change. That's a, there's an open issue right now. In SPDX 2.3, we have a package purpose. Um, one of the things, one of the tooling that I support is a round, is a uh, uh, translation tool between Cyclone DX and SPDX. And you need a package purpose to be able to translate, because Cyclone DX has this thing called a type, which we call a purpose. And there's only one in Cyclone DX, so if I have four of them in uh, SPDX and one in Cyclone DX, which one do I pick? So we need a primary package purpose. Uh, there are some in the community that would like to have additional purposes to be expressed. So we may end up with two properties, one primary package purpose and one package purpose. That's, that's yet to be decided. Um, and the last uh, renaming has, is specific to JSON right now in JSON. All of the arrays uh, are pluralized. So in the model, we'll have like, you know, uh, property X. 
And then in the uh, uh, JSON, we'll say property X's, <laughs> you know, to make it plural. That's gone. We're just going to use singular. We're going to simplify it, and it's just going to be singular. It may read a little odd to some people, but we decided it's more important to be consistent within the SPDX serializations uh, than to uh, attempt this complex algorithm of making it pluralized. There's a whole bunch of classes and properties added. I'm not going to go over these because, quite honestly, these are very related to the prior presentation, so I think you got a lot better you know, overview of what these things that are being added here, but these are all to support some of the, uh, the new use cases and, uh, and profiles. So um, that's, that's my detail of it, and backing up a little, you know, from, from the big picture, um, these changes that we're talking about should provide more flexibility, especially with the new relationship structure, provide uh, better support for scalability. I'm hoping the net result is a simpler SPDX implementation. Um, and uh, as always, we're always adding new use cases with the profiles. By the way, I'm very excited about the AI work that's going on. I think that's so cool that we're you know, supporting that in the next release. And then uh, just write this down in your notes. Uh, the, uh, no, we'll, we'll upload these so you can, uh, <laughs> you'll be able to copy and paste this. There's a, there's a document that, uh, that's kind of a living document that we're recording all of the migrations with very specific recommendations on how to upgrade from 2.3 to 3.0. So the structural changes are in there, all the renames, and then as we make changes between the release candidate one and release candidate two, we'll be updating that document with that. So um, that's what I have. And am I the last presenter? Oh, good. Thanks for staying awake on the last presentation. Very simple question. Yeah. Why is that final document not marked down? Why is it still Google Docs? <laughs> I don't know. That's just what I picked. <laughs> good question. We should move it to markdown, though. I think you're right. I, and, and tie it to the release. Yeah. It, yeah, yeah, but I, it's a good point. Point well taken. Yeah. Well, Gary, any thoughts about uh, creating assurance in the S bombs during the development process? Have you seen any best practices how people collect that information that goes in the S bomb fields? So when you when you say assurance, um, can you describe a little more what is being assured? Um, so the elements you're presenting, right? It's the last mile, whoever generated it, mm -hmm. you just trust him, right? Ah, gotcha. So yeah, there's a few things, and, and this isn't really unique to SPDX3. There, there's, um, there's one one part of that problem we've tackled, I think, reasonably well. Actually, I'd say there's, there's two out of three parts we've tackled, and one we've decided not to, okay, when it comes to insurance, assurance. One is we have creation information in the 2.3 and 3.0 spec that fully uh, identifies who created, who's responsible for that SPDX document. In 3.0, the creation information is now tied all the way down to the element. So you can have a document and it can ha you can actually have different creation information for the different elements, but you know who created each and every one, when they created it and, and, and all of that. The second thing that we, we did tackle is if you're referencing a, an element that's not in your document but is externally, there's verification mechanisms to make sure that that document wasn't tampered with. So we have verification and checksums, and we also have verification checksums and, and hashes for the uh, artifacts that are pointed to by or represented by the metadata in the SPDX document. So you know, so if you can actually get a hold of that artifact, you can check sum it, look to see what the checksum value of the SPDX document, and that'll, so that's all there. The one thing we did not tackle is how do I know, you know, there's no digital signature on the, on the SBOM itself. And, and that was a conscious decision uh, because, you know, once you get into that, you need to have a certification authority, you need to have a whole infrastructure to support that. And we thought it would be best left to um, other standards. You know, so we'll produce this chunk of bytes, right? And then we would encourage other standards community, you know, SIGSTOR, others, you know, to actually wrap that in a, you know, some kind of a digital signature standard. 
So I think there's a lot of interest in including that. It, we just don't want to duplicate what other standards have done. Oh, okay. So I have a question for the build profile. Um, <clears throat> do, is there support for self-attestation for a secure build? Like there's a new um, NIST requirement that, you know, people who are selling software to the government must self-attest that they have a secure build. Um, is there a way to do that in the build profile? Yeah, I, I think there's, um, so the NIST SSDF attestation, I think that covers a little bit more as well. I'll talk the build, but um, one, at least isolated to that part of the build, I think we, we don't explicitly say it because the format isn't necessarily, well, at the time of writing, wasn't even published. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we could see that as a use case where you could include that as an excellent reference as part of the build element for yeah. that particular component. Yeah. Um, in your first slide about structural changes, you mentioned conformance, uh, namespace, and organization. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of organization? I didn't catch. Oh, I um, understand that. that's just, it's internal to the SPDX community. It's how we organize ourselves. So we have like a, a, uh, a weekly meeting for the core team, and then we have like a bi-weekly meeting or every other week. So it's just how we organize ourselves. It, it, I just mentioned it because some people get confused, you know, it's like, why are you calling this meeting the profile? You know, it's, it's, it's kind of part of how we organize. It's the verb, yeah. not the noun. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I was curious, um, generally, uh, and, and maybe this is a, a very general question, like who, uh, like are, are the consumers of these SPDX documents ever considered to be like end users? Like I'm thinking of, uh -huh. of people who are like, you know, they receive like a consumer electronics device and like is, is that something that, that they can review to see like, oh, well, what's in here? Like what kind of code can I get? That sort of thing. Yeah. Like is that an, a kind of an intended use case? Yeah. So. Um Yes, is the short answer. You know, we do intend for it to be delivered to end users. There is a, an ongoing debate about the serialization formats and what are the trade-offs between human readability and machine readability uh, within the community. Um, but there is one format in 2.3, and it'll be interesting to see if it's feasible to support this in 3.0, I think it is, is the spreadsheet format. So we talk about tag value, we talk, which is a text format, and we talk about JSON, we talk about all these others, but uh, I'll tell you, I, in my job, I deliver SPDX documents to end users, and it's, it's in the spreadsheet format, because lawyers love spreadsheets. So that's how I send out the, uh, uh, you know, the, the format, so, so yes. Going back to the uh, first presentation from Steve, uh, I noticed that one of the operators mentioned in expressions was uh, a unary uh, or later operator, mm -hmm. the plus symbol. And my understanding was earlier this was deprecated because ah. license IDs are just strings that represent licenses. So does this mean there's now a recognition that several licenses in a list are successive revisions of the same license? Yes. Gary, it, I it, could speak to that if. Oh, uh, go ahead. Or, I don't know if I'm still on the audio. Hey. You are. <laughs> you are. Yes, yes. Like, I'm looking around. Where did that voice come from? Okay. Go ahead, Steve. Um, yeah, so just to respond to that, the uh, so that plus operator, the or later operator, so just to be clear, that's always been present, or at least for years and years has been present. What it's meant to signify is that the applicable license is the corresponding license that's specified or any later version of it. Um, as far as SPDX is concerned, we're not, like if you look at the SPDX license list, there's not any sort of syntactic meaning or anything that we're, def we're defining to say, this license is a later version of that other license or anything like that. So it's not necessarily, like SPDX isn't, going to, isn't in the business of saying, this, you know, this version 2.1 is later than that version 1.3 or kind of other ways of specifying. It's more meant to signal to the consumer of the SBOM that the 
included license or the declared license says it's this one or any later version. So there's nuances around it, particularly when it comes to some of the GNU licenses um, due to some of the requests that came from them and the FSF about how to how to communicate uh, only or or later in the context of some of the GP, GPL, LGPL, and so on. So it's short version, it's complicated, but that I guess just to say that plus operator has always been there. And so we're just signaling it will continue to be. Okay. So um, Kate had mentioned that you with uh, 3.0, you might go to ISO to get it certified. Mm -hmm. What are the criteria to make that decision? Boy, um, do you want me to try answering that? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's stability of the spec. You know, it, it's a lot of effort to go through ISO, and you know, we we want to make sure we don't have to go through it too frequently. So once it's fully stable, um, and, and we feel like the rate of change has kind of come down on it, I think that's when we'll go through ISO. You know, we go through the past. Because of the we go through the pass, which means we're in, in the field and in use. And so we go through that path to go into ISO. At least that's how we did with the 2.2 spec. And we'll probably do the same thing here. Okay. Our challenge is going to be moving from this model version we've got right now to updating our docs will be a nice little challenge for us. So it won't be quick. Gotcha. I want to go back to one of the questions that gentleman asked about uh, human readable format. And you yeah. mentioned you love spreadsheet. Is there another way to present? Because I see there will be a lot of consumer electronics, mm -hmm. especially in the healthcare sector, that may require some visibility into what's in there, or especially vulnerabilities before somebody can start using for critical healthcare needs. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, we're definitely considering, you know, can support continuing to support tag value, and that's an ongoing. Like, I don't think we've come to a resolution yet on that. But it's definitely an ongoing discussion on, you know, what, what's, and that's kind of like the next step for SPDX, by the way. Now that we have the model kind of solid, you know, still being reviewed, you still have an opportunity, you know, to influence it. But uh, we're going to sh start shifting our focus to the serialization format. I'll give you my personal opinion on this, um, and I know if this is going <laughs> to invoke a reaction from some of the other SPDX community, but. My, my personal opinion is I think having like a tag value type of format makes a lot of sense with certain profiles. But with some of the other profiles, which are very complicated, trying to force that into a flat two-dimensional structure is going to be extremely difficult. So my opinion is we support it, but we limit what profiles we support it for. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah, uh, actually, I would say that that is a great opportunity for, you know, if there are any startup companies out here, uh, <laughs> to actually implement UIs for these. Because what what's nice about SPDX 3.0 is that it's easily uh, encoded into like a database format. So there's a schema right there for you to implement, and we're working on serializations that you can convert from your database schema so you can make SQL queries, get JSON, and then uh, display that JSON in like something written in React.js. So these are all uh, things that can be f pretty easily implemented. And so my, my humble opinion about this is that um, you will no longer want to look at spreadsheets. There'll be, <laughs> there'll be some uh, pretty UI that you would rather like to look at. Um, uh, my my question is more on the defect side. Um, I think one of the use cases I'm thinking through is like, um, I'm scanning for vulnerability, but I may throw like usually we throw like a couple scanners at it. Um, and I think in kind of like the decision making, it's helpful to know like um, kind of looking at the evidence or like which scanner this particular scan came from. Um, would that be encodable today? Or like how would you encode that? Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. The, so you want a way to communicate the scan that picked up the CVE? 
Yeah, I think. Has that been the evidence? So we have to act it's in creation info. Yeah. Actor, oh, that must be Thomas. Thomas, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so there is an optional field. Uh, so in SPX 2.0, you had the creation info field where you can say basically which tool created the uh, the whole ASBOM. There's also, that's on every element in SPX 2.0. So optionally, you can for every element where you have vulnerability information or where, uh, you can basically say like this was created by this tool. So if you have say, and there's also uh, relationships. So there's multiple ways how we can do this, but it is possible to exactly say which one scanner that actually I need to look at the license profile because there I need to look if it works the same but again only now for the first release these two came together and we need to make sure that both mechanisms will work the same but it's possible to show multiple because uh, again I worked personally on OS Toolkit or ORTS and we have multiple security scanners and multiple license scanners basically giving information into the SBOM and it was always tricky to tell which one is which and now, for especially for security, we're introducing a lot of different uh, agents, we call them now. I always keep the word actor. So basically, you can exactly say that this tool, organization, or person uh, did a particular thing. That's all possible, but it's all optional. So if you want to, you can include it. If you don't want to, you don't have to. I think you could also use like a published by relationship um besides the creation info. But then you, that would be much. So that would be on the relationship though, because yeah, the, the relationship of a vulnerabilities um, affected, a package affected by vulnerability is included within the relationship and not the individual. Yes, elements. but you can, this is the weird thing where people really have to get their head around. Is that Relationships right? are elements. Yeah. <laughs> So you can link to relationships. You can point with relationships to relationships. I know graph databases don't like that. <laughs> so, so I, I guess it's, it's, so I, I guess that's okay for the new model, right? That's like, yeah, yeah. Recommended. I, but this is the relationships on relationship. We, we moved <laughs> the relationship to be a, uh, an element. And by doing that, relationships are allowed to have relations. I had a debate with one of the other community members, William. It's like, nobody's ever going to use relationships for relationship. And then these things come up. It's like, oh, man, maybe I'm wrong. You know, I don't, it does make it more complicated, though. So we, we had this discussion in the implementers group. And I was tasked to communicate that we're not very happy about that. <laughs> so. Uh, having relationships pointing to other relationships is going to break a lot of internal representations on existing tools. So um, if we can constrain them not to, I mean, I know this is this opens a whole yeah, can of worms, yeah. but uh, just voicing the opinion of that group. Is it the uh, having a um, undirected graph? Is that the issue? Exactly. Cycles in mm -hmm. the graph. Yeah. Yep. By the way, cycles in the graph are possible in 2.3 right now, too, so. Yeah, but you can dedupe them, right? You can dedupe them, so, oh, yeah. Th so uh, before yeah. opening uh, for other questions like this, I would like to know, so how many people here are working on SPDX tools or SBOM tools in general? All right, like around half or a little bit more. How many people are new to SPDX or to SBOMs? Okay. All right. So if it if at, at any point gets boring or you need more clarification, please. We've got another question here. Thanks. I've got a question about tooling. Now, the previous uh, talk mentioned uh, a couple of examples of builds on uh, GitHub Actions and some Yocto builds and how the, the metadata you need to uh, uh, to build, a, I guess, a build element was, was already there for GitHub Actions. Um, but what's the state of tooling for actually uh, getting that data out into a, a usable form? Or is it still all custom uh, work that has to be done in, in all cases, or are some of the cases like Yocto and GitHub Actions, there's, there's tools out there that, that do uh, the, the heavy lifting for you already? Yeah, I think that um, 
in terms of like tooling implementing some of this, I think on the high level, like the inputs and the things are all captured, there definitely will be some fields that need a little bit more instrumentation or like a little bit more intention uh, on the tooling to do. Um, another path forward with this is um, with regards to you know other standards like salsa that are kind of also being um, pursued. I think the idea that we looked at in this group is like looking at salsa and reproducible builds. There's a lot of information already out there. Uh, if any build tools do produce those kind of um, documents, we would then be able to do a direct translation uh, to the build profile as well. So I, I think that in general, there is a good amount of information um, that is captured by build tools, which meet some use, use cases, but not some. So I think in general, most of the use cases can be met with information available today. If you're looking at like safety, then it may require a little bit more instrumentation, like you know, you have a P trace to make sure that you're capturing every single command that you're writing. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's at least our approach to that. And Kate, too. So one of the things we are doing is we have reference libraries for producing and consuming SPDX documents. So we have it for um, Python, Go, and Java. Java. Yeah. And so these libraries, if you hook into them with 2.3 today, we'll be making sure that they're available for 3.0. So if you wanted to abstract and minimize your burden back and forth and be able to consume, I'd say hook into these libraries that we're working and putting out as part of the community. And that should give you an accelerator. In addition to what's happening in Yocto, I'll also mention that in Zephyr, we've been doing the generation directly out of the build. And so the information is there. Every time you build an image, you can have effectively your S-bombs, multiple S-bombs that relate to each other created. Yeah. And so I can point you to a dashboard that has over 400 boards across six apps after this. It's already there. And you can just, anything that says built or passed, you can let download the S-bombs as part of the images. So it's, it's eminently doable. Yocto is also showing that you can do it with your tool chains, because Yocto, basically, you build your tool chain that then goes and builds the images, the libraries, and so forth, that then assembles it. So the, what we're going to need for safety, you can see elements of it being happening already today. And I think with the 3.0, we'll be able to take it even further. Yeah, so it, just to add to what Kate said, in 2.3 today, you know, uh, GitHub's producing SPDX, uh, Zephyr, uh, Yocto, we have a Maven plugin. We've just introduced a, uh, what is it? The, uh, help me out, Brandon. The <laughs> Maven and uh, the Gradle. Gradle. We got a Gradle plugin that produces. So those particular build environments are, are covered with tools that are available today and, uh, you know, many more. And if any of you are in a particular tooling ecosystem and want to contribute, We'd love for you to contribute open source in this area. Uh, just talk to me and we could uh, look at bringing it in. By the way, Kate mentioned libraries. Anybody use uh, JavaScript or TypeScript? Okay. Any interest in producing a library for us? <laughs> That's next on my list. You know, so feel free to contribute. Uh, Gary. Maybe to add, we're, we're missing one more thing. What's that? Can you hear me, Gary? Yep, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, also what I did for 3.0, so there, there is, again, for me, we're now in the time of any SBOM, where lots of tools produce SBOM, but a lot of the information is incorrect or missing. And that's partially due to the, the build tools itself not giving you all the information or the information is incorrect, and we couldn't always translate it. So. In, in 3.0, I added several additional fields that should allow build tools to directly put the raw data that they have directly as uh, external uh, references on the, uh, on, the, on the package level. And then other tools can then process that. Because a lot of the metadata, people familiar with open source clients, the, the metadata for the packages is wrong. And the burden was always, if you want to get package management, the idea is always with SPDX, we go upstream to the package managers and then the package manager who directly produce SBOMs. But sometimes even the package managers, they cannot correct all the data. For instance, a misspelled GitHub URL, right? So what do you want in the old 2.0, if you want to translate that to a download location, if you would, the tool would get stuck 
and then basically yeah it wouldn't translate properly now in 3.0 the tool could still output it as a reference link even if that link is broken and then a further tool on the, the tool chain can then basically work and process it because uh, like working on clearly defined earthly i can tell you that about 40 percent of all metadata for all the major ecosystems is broken in one form or another and so sometimes so, yeah. slightly broken sometimes really broken a lot yeah. broken yeah, yeah. And so that, that's why I said in, uh, that's why Orta Rework, we have this whole curation mechanism where you can fix it. But said, if all goes well for SPX 3.0, we'll implement Ort and there will be a GitHub action and a GitHub pipeline and we'll support, we are supporting 20 plus different package managers out of the box. So we'll, we'll generate SPX 3.0 for 20 different package managers in one go. Uh, hopefully, a bit luck at launch of 3.0. Depends how long we take. Yeah, and, and you know, on the broader topic of you know going beyond just the build, there there's a uh, uh, there's an open chain tooling work group, um, and if you're not familiar with that, that's a good forum to join and uh, discuss tooling in general, including ORT or the uh, ORT that uh, Thomas is working on, plus a few other scanning tools that are open source in nature. And of course, there's a lot of commercial tools out there too that I'm sure you're familiar with that that actually will do the analysis and generate S bombs. So lots of tooling out there, more needed. Uh, Gary, the group is now renamed. It's Open Chain Automation Working Group. Now everybody's renaming things on me. Okay, Open Chain Automation Working Group. The name, the name, the current name of the group. Yes. So Thanks, Thomas. I may go back um, to my previous comments about defects, uh, exposure, and S bomb. Um, from a user perspective. That's very time consuming, especially with the CI CD deployment where you will not have time to look at all the defects, whether or not to accept the software and deploy. So having defects somewhere in the S bomb that's machine readable, and you can have, if AI is supporting, do the impact analysis, you could have machine making the decision for greenfield deployments. Mm -hmm. Good point. I don't know if the Karen, did you want to do? Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm just curious. I mean, I am new uh, to some of these tools. D is any of the tool makers do using AI powered tools to to take some of the data? No, because I can see with vulnerabilities, this would be a huge opportunity to build a tool. Mm -hmm. uh, yes and no. <laughs> so in the Open Chain Automation Group, we had discussions on this. And for, let, it's two parts. If you look at licensing, using AI is not really useful. Um, because in licensing, actually, we're looking for the opposite. So we're not looking for like the Apache license. We can find a million examples of the Apache license and detect it properly. But you're looking for the anomalies. And there have been several experiments looking for those anomalies. With AI, it didn't really work. Coming to security, it's interesting. Yes, you can parse basically CVEs and all the broken information to get better metadata. But the problem is still, and if you're familiar with security and you look at the security data providers, the information that you get is generally terrible. Um, to the point that I was looking today whether I could figure up for like even a lot of this, the, the information that if the, if the GitHub repository was mentioned for the project. It's not there. It's all not properly structured. It, it's all not. So yes, there is still a lot of work to, to be done, but that's why you now also see like things like OSV and all of the others coming in, basically doing an open source version of the security feeds to basically work on getting that data better because it's, I'm sorry to say, a lot of the data that we get from the commercial tools is it's useful, but not perfect. It, it, running AI on it would really be tricky. And we have done experiments with it. It's, it's terrible. Yeah, we ran into two issues with, you know, um, automating security. One is correlation. You know, we get information about an S-bomb and correlating that to a database isn't perfect. We don't have a good ID structure. In SPDX, external refs is the secret to that. Put as many external refs as you can find. If you got the software ID, put that in. If you got what used to be called Git bomb, which is now called something new, 
Omni, <laughs> put that in, you know, uh, certainly uh, Pearl's package URLs are, the, are the, the favorite ones. Download locations can be used. Um, put them all in because, as Thomas mentioned, you know, the, the, the metadata is not perfect. It doesn't correlate. Maybe if the Pearl's wrong but the SWID is right, you know, you can correlate and you can find the information there. Um, the other problem we run into is stale data. So somebody, I mean, I run into this all the time. I, as you know, as Thomas just mentioned, uh, you go to the GitHub, you know, uh, homepage, and somebody mo moved it or renamed it or something. So the URL's all messed up. So uh, stale data is also an issue because the S bombs were produced at one point in time, but you may be looking for the information based on that F bomb at a much later point in time, and lots of things can change on the internet. So we were talking a bit about tooling, and I think it was mentioned that, for example, in, in Zephyr, there's some, some tooling that created um, these SPX documents automatically. And I was, I was just wondering if there's, um, like thinking in terms of license compliance, like I know we've got the, um, the license profile, um, and we also have the build profile, and, and a lot of uh, licenses, especially the copyleft ones, uh, require build uh, and, well, and installation information. Um, and so I'm just wondering if there's a way to, or if it's been considered to have it either required or, or at least highly suggested um, when using certain licenses where, where these requirements are known to exist, um, uh, to also have a build profile to go along with it um, to assist people in, in complying with these terms of the license. Um, because uh, I, I think that's a common area where, at least in, in my research, that, that there's often often some something lacking. Okay. So I could... I, go oh. for it, Steve. You're online. <laughs> I can speak to that. Sorry. He wrote the sorry, Caden. No, sorry. I, I can speak to that, and then you you're, feel free to jump in, too. Um, yeah, I think definitely, I think one of the ways that I understand SPDX kind of from the early days has talked about license compliance. Um, has been the idea that an SPDX document or an, S an SPDX SBOM is helpful, it's useful for compliance, but it itself is not meant to kind of represent or consist compliance. Part of the idea being that SPDX as a project is kind of studiously trying not to make legal decisions or legal opinions or say, this is what you should do or should not do to comply with this or that license. We have, Represent instead focusing on representing metadata, trying to enable other folks to, you know, kind of being the upstream for representing the metadata, but let other organizations, other folks provide recommendations about how to use it, how to use SPX data to comply with licenses. So I think some of what's there, some of how we think about structuring licenses, structuring the other metadata is definitely informed by what the general requirements are for the licenses. So in the particularly in things like some of the relationships that have been previously defined for SPDX 2, 3, and earlier. There are different relationship types in there having to do with the different ways that uh, files or packages can be linked to one another, the different ways that one can be a distribution artifact or metadata about or various other things. So it's kind of, I think the concept from SPDX's perspective of being, this is information that is helpful for and can inform your decisions on compliance, but then leaving it to the downstream users or other organizations to you know, pr provide their own recommendations about how to do compliance based on that. Kate, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in there, so I'll let nope, you <laughs> carry it on. It's all good. It's all good, Steve. So the other side of it is um, as long as people use the SPDX identifiers, a lot of the tools are able to pull the licensing information out and surface it in the metadata. If not, it takes scanners and other tools and things like that to guess. But if we've got the IDs in, um, both in the Zephyr project and the Octo project, they're pulling it out and making it visible and available. Now, to Steve's point, we're trying to make it available and visible. We're not trying to be a policy engine. There are other organizations, I'm thinking in particular, I think OSATL and a few other in Europe, that want to consume the SPDX and issue re recommended for policy. And so that's probably where, like, again, it's separation of responsibilities, and we're focusing on trying to get the data as accurate as we can and move it forward. And then other people will say, okay, hey, oh, you're looking at this GPL. 
uh, you should be doing this, this, and this. Oh, you've got a patch sheet, do this, 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 and this. And so there was, you know, I think um, Jelaine put some stuff out about that, and others have put out recommendations, but um, automatically uh, applying it and so forth, we are saying that is not our space, that's someone else to do it, okay? We just want to make sure that the information is available so it's easier to automate this type of thing. For sure, yeah, I, I appreciate that. It's, it's good to know where the kind of the recommendations should come in versus just the, the data. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, one more. Thank you. Uh, I have a one request to a serialization group. Uh, I very appreciate if you could share the working draft for the uh, JSON schema or mm. JSON context mm, mm -hmm. because uh, Japanese are difficult to attend the regular meeting. So, and um, because of the time zone. So, mm -hmm. I, we are uh, catch up with uh, by emails or some minutes. But uh, minutes are uh, sometimes located at GitHub, sometimes located at uh, in uh, yes. Etherpad. Yeah. And so, so, so Sometimes in an email. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, it's very difficult to catch up with. Mm -hmm. So, I appreciate it if you uh, shared on some certain place, uh, such as GitHub and so on. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, the serialization, you know, as I mentioned, that's going to be our next focus, and I, I think that's a very reasonable request. Um, the serialization group actually meets at a time that I can't attend either, so I'm in the same position as you. Uh, but I will pass along that request, and we are going to have a, a, a special meeting just on serialization shortly after this meeting. And uh, between Kate and I, we'll bring that request in that we document the schema. Yeah. And the other thing that's going to happen with the uh, SPDX GitHub repo, the model repo, it'll actually generate a schema. So when we check in a new uh, changes to the markdown files, it'll, ge it'll regenerate the uh, JSON schema, uh, so it'll be current. That, that tooling isn't working quite yet, but it should be working within a month or so. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you.